August 28th, 2013. I'm Matt Gradwall from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on Twitter at Uppercut Wood or on the web at UppercutWoodworks.com. If you're watching the video and you want to participate in the chat, uh, head over to UppercutWoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chat room. Sign in with your Twitter account and you are in. Um, with me tonight, as always, is the co-host Chris. Say hey. Hello, everybody. Uh, Chris Wong here from Flare Woodworks. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Flare Woodworks and check out my website, FlareWoodworks.com. There's a uh, awesome blog there and giveaways and everything you could possibly need that I can provide. We've got uh, two special guests with us tonight, uh, Andy Brunel. How are you doing, Andy? I'm good. How's everyone going? We're just doing great, Andy. We're on time and we're just rolling here. Where can people find you on the web, Andy? Uh, I'm at brownellfurniture.com. That's B-R-O-W-N-E-L-L furniture.com. And on Twitter, your handle is? Uh, it's at Alan Warb, A-L-L-E-N-W-O-R-B. Excellent. And our second guest, who is our latest participant in the telephone game, is Eric Boucher. Howdy. Eric, how are you doing today? Great. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And your Twitter handle is eBoucher on Twitter, and you have a blog as well, correct? Yeah, greenbushdesign.wordpress.com. All right. So you can check out what he's up to there. He's got all kinds of interesting stuff. It's actually one of my favorite, favorite blogs to follow. Cool, thanks. So, um, Matt, where are we going to start tonight? Um, why don't we start with the telephone design game update since we didn't get to do that last week. Let's get yes. caught up on that. And also because it's cool. Because it's cool. It's cool. What's particularly cool about this is Eric is the first one to complete a mock-up. I say complete because Diami tried to do one and kind of, kind of fell apart on him. Um, but this one's out of real wood, so it held together just, just fine. So let's start with this... Uh, this picture down here, Eric, you can tell us about your design. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, this is about 10 or 11 weeks going now with this uh, with this game, and I decided to just kind of change up the function of this piece a little bit. So the easiest way to do that is simply I cut the legs off, and now instead of a desk, we have a low table or maybe like a coffee table. Um, it's about four feet long, 24 inches wide on the wide end, 18 inches on the short, and maybe 16, 17 inches tall. Um, the the undercarriage of it, not if you take the top away, the design before from Tim Charles had, you know, it was kind of a craftsman, arts and crafts look to it, the way he designed his um, his sides and his legs. So I kind of continued that a little bit, um, made the uh, made the kind of the vertical styles there a little asymmetrical. One's a little wider than the other. Um, it's still by the you know, but by the time I finished it, it was still a little bit more of an arts and crafts kind of look that I was going for. But I don't know. I think it kind of works. Um, and so the. The rails or stretchers that go across the length of it, I kind of call them the spines on this piece. Typically, on a coffee table, they would not. They would go straight into the legs, right? So you'd have you have this kind of front rail that uh, that connects like on the apron. yeah, kind of you know connects on the ninety degree face of the of the um, of the leg and on the front and the back and that always looks on coffee tables that always looks a little heavy to me because you know you have this big bar of wood right underneath the coat and um, so. so what I did is I took those and I pushed them back in underneath and instead of connecting into the legs I notched them in to the top stretcher there that you know that um, the top rail and you know, that kind of pushes them visually out of the way a little bit. It still gives support to the top. Um, and one of them is kind of 
curve, which follows the natural curve of, um, of the top itself. In this particular case, I actually steam bin it. I just I put it into a wow. uh, put it into a vegetable steamer on the up on the stove top, <laughs> and for for about 20 minutes, and it, and then and then curved and then bent it in on a form, and it worked fine. Cool. Um, if you were going to build this, you know, full size, you could still steam bin it, and you know, it's such a gentle curve. I don't even know if you'd have to use oak or ash or something or a you know a, a ring porous wood like that. It, my guess is because of it's so gentle of a curve, cherry walnut would probably work. Um, I think so too. You know, and if you didn't, you could always fire up your tuned up bandsaw and do a bent lamination if you really want to do that. Um, the top, you know, it, the, the the two stretchers that go underneath there, the long spines, it might be overkill if you have a thicker top. Um, you might be able to get away with just one down the center. Um, I think you'd still need something, not only for ease of construction, because it kind of keeps everything upright, so you can put the, you know, connect your two ends. But if, if it's a if it's a coffee table, at some point somebody's going to sit on it. You know, I mean, somebody's going to use it as a chair. So it's good to have something underneath there. Um, if you have a big thick top, though, you might just be able to get away with one center stretcher down the middle. Um, if you want a, you know, a little bit of lighter look the two might be better support like it is. Um, and then the, so, the, so the, I think the undercarriage has a pretty, tr except for the, the curve there and the little bit of asymmetry, it's a pretty traditional look. It's, you know, kind of arts and craftsy kind of look. Uh, the top is more modern looking, obviously. It's got that, it's got that curve to it. Um, I had gone back and forth on, on to put a shelf across the back, or at some point I was just going to leave it flat, but then I went back and looked at all the different designs. Yeah. Starting with Chris's, you know, he has that sunken, that sunken feature in the, in, the, um, in the top, and man, that design has persisted. Every, <laughs> every single person has kept that, to, to in one form or another, has kept that kind of two-layer top. So I was like, okay, I got to do some sort of, you know, um, some sort of shelf there. So I simply just took another piece of wood and put it across and kind of carved it in. What I was going for there is that that shelf would sort of flow into the main kind of uh, table there. So it's not an abrupt edge. It's it would look more like a carved kind of edge and. A little bit of asymmetry. It's kind of got a yin yang, you know. The, 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 yeah. skinny, the skinny piece on the on the top is on the wide end, and by you know, and vice versa. So it's um, and you know, I, I just stained that that shelf to kind of play with. You could do it as a different wood, um, or you could do it as the same wood. Or I even thought if you really wanted to be, <laughs> if you really wanted to go for it, you could take a big old slab and literally carve that. Shelf into it. Um, <laughs> if you really, I mean, you waste a lot of wood that way, but it might look it might look pretty cool um, to do that kind of thing. Or you could just laminate up two pieces and kind of blow it in. Um, so it's you know that the top I wanted to kind of modernize a little bit. Arts and craft. I like arts and crafts furniture. It's it's obviously it, it's pretty timeless. It's you know people still build it. People still like it, but. If I had a whole house of it, it might start to look a little boxy, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and everything's just square, and you know, and uh, and such. As much as I like it, I I think I'd have to have a few maybe more modern pieces in my house to to kind of play on that. So that's what the top was about. It was it was it was to create some sort of um, you know dichotomy with the more traditional looking undercarriage. I think you so, did a great uh, job with the design. Yeah, it's very cool. So, yeah, you know, it was fun. I, um, you know, I going back and looking at all the different designs that people have done, and, and you know, I didn't. I decided to just kind of maybe change the function here a little bit. This thing could go in a lot of different directions. Um, some people's even started to to look less like a desk and like other things. Just a few little tweaks, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I figured the easiest way to do that would just be to lower the whole thing and you know, see where it goes from there. 
I like the uh, the asymmetric uh, vertical elements there on on each of the sides. I yeah, think that's pretty cool. Right. So yeah. you've got a wide a wide slot here, and then a narrow, and then a wide, and then a narrow, right? Yeah, and they're um they're mirror images of each other. So if you're looking at the table, the wide ones on the left, no matter which side you're on, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't know. Just just a little thing. It's just again that's that's creating a little bit of a of a departure from the traditional arts and crafts thing, you know. Just throwing a little bit of asymmetry in there to uh, to to catch your eye. That's neat. And the spacing with between the slats also varies too. You have a narrow space here, and right. these two are equal. I'm guessing. Yeah, somewhat equal. You know, when you when you think it out in your head and then you start gluing those little pieces together, well, where they end up going is where they end up going. <laughs> you know, right. but yeah, I was I was looking to kind of vary things a little bit there. It's almost like you could use the uh, the solid piece and then the voids between them and, and use that um, that progression what the Fibonacci sequence or something, so it would kind of mimic that. Yeah. Yeah, I would you know, the notches, the, the undercarriage would be all motor and tenon, except for those things that are kind of, except for those stretchers that are half lapped in. And I think you'd still be okay. Those, those tenons don't have to go very far in. So even if, if a notch was like in the same alignment, I don't think you'd run into a big problem there. But yeah, you, it'd be better to kind of play off of those distances and see if you could line them up. Um, and the other thing is, you know, with the model, the few things that I've built and designed, I don't, I don't design every little element beforehand. Um, the undercarriage would likely get a lot more details. You know, the, the legs might get flared a little. There'd probably be chamfers on everything. I'd have stop chamfers on those vertical slats. You know, those little things I tend to put in when I'm when I'm building. You know, I kind of I kind of play with a few things and say, okay, this is going to look good. I just don't. There's just no way I can design every little element down to a T before I start building it. So yeah, I leave yeah. little th I leave little things like that when I'm building. So that you know that base would likely get a little bit more decoration to it yeah. if I if I was, if I was going to build it. You know. Yeah, I've um, I've been going through a, a similar process with a miniature scale model a few times, and yeah, you. Dialing, spending a lot of the time dialing in all those details on a small piece like that, it's just so tough to tell because you're dealing in such yeah, minuscule yeah. dimensions, you know, like an eighth inch or a sixteenth inch edge on a miniature translates into something much more significant in in the full size piece. And it's just tough to tell until you see the full size. Yeah, and it's it's a lot easier when you're building a model to get the, you're looking for scale, you're looking to actually build it to, to, to scale and it's much easier to do the lengths and the widths and the heights than it is the thickness. That's the, like the, the thickness of the wood is, you know, I'm dealing with little quarter inch pieces mm -hmm. and, and getting those to be, you know, actually to scale and thickness is, is tougher. Than all the rest of it, so I, I kind of yeah. don't. I don't bother with it. I know what it's. I know in my head what it's going to be. So, you know, those slats are going to be thinner than what the model appears. They're, you know, those are going to get thinned down to maybe five eighths of an inch or something. You know, well, what's the scale you used? In terms of, well, I just I, I roughed out my dimensions. I said, okay, it's going to be about four feet, you know, long, and it's one to eight. And that works out nice with quarter inch boards because I have two inch legs mm -hmm. and quarter inch equals would e uh, times eight would equal two inches. Okay. So you can you can cut that to a two inch to a quarter inch. You can cut that to quarter by quarter, and that's a that's a two inch square. So it's it's one to eight. Okay. Yeah, I found myself milling up stuff for you know seven eighths inch thick stock at one sixth scale. And you're you're down to like an eighth of an inch or less. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a lot of tiny pieces. Yeah, it is. But they're they're fun, and, and you know, for me, I can this this is sitting on my table, and I walk by it every day, and I, I'm not one of these who just designs something and then and then three days later builds it. I but I can afford to do that because I'm not a professional. <laughs> so I usually design something and then I put it aside and I look at it for weeks. 
and I tweak it a little bit, and if I don't like it, I tweak, you know, and then I, I get around to building it. So the nice thing about these is you can set them on the table, and, and you look at it almost every day, and if there's yeah. something about it that you may not like, then it's it's much easier to see that than like a SketchUp model or something like that because it's there sitting sitting. Um, yeah, you can you, know, in, you can interact with it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's I, something something neat about the tangible aspect of a miniature model that that does give you a little bit more perspective in terms of what your changes or what your ideas can translate to into a into a, a three dimensional piece that I just. I've never been successful in doing that with, with drawing. I mean, SketchUp, I think it's probably a different story, but I just haven't gone down that path. Yeah. And I, 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 work, in, I work in CAD during the day for my day job, so, I, you know, I've just never got into SketchUp because my, my woodworking gets me away from the computer, <laughs> which is where I spend eight hours a day, you know? Yeah. So I, I like to, I'll, I draw by hand on graph paper and such, or I'll build, like, quickie models like this because... I you know it's just that's that's what I like about my woodworking is it it's you know gets me out from you know working in front of a computer. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you as far as as far as getting away from the computer. Like I'm sure a few of us here. No. No. Very no. When working with miniatures, how do you make sure that you get the human scale? of the piece right. So I'll give you an example. Um, Rob, Rob, Rob Boas did a desk where the first thing he did to get the proportions right was he built um, a scale model out of the pink uh, insulation foam. Yeah. Make sure that yeah. he had the right height, right width, right, right depth, all that stuff. How do you, how do you get that right with your scale models? Yeah, I, I uh, Normally, I'll just use cardboard and toothpicks. Is a, is a is a that's my first take on things, kind of like with the styrofoam, and you, you kind of play with that. Do a large size in that. I'll do it larger than this. Yes, but but, and, you know, not, but not full size. No, no, not full size. No, um, I know that uh, Gary Rogowski here in town. He's a big advocate for doing full size drawings. He has big. He has a big butcher block, 36 inch paper. Yeah. On a roll, and he rolls that out, and he draws everything full size. And for him, and then he pins it up on the wall. And for him, that's how he gets it. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't go that far. I. I just trust that you know. I do my my ratios and say, okay, I think this will work. And then I'll um, I'll draw out some of the joinery full size. Mm -hmm. But not the not the not the full, not the whole thing. Yeah, the the full size drawing is really helpful when you use angles and curves mm -hmm. because yeah. you can just put set your bevel gauge down and you have your angle. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if you guys had a trick or if you used what I, you know kind of standard dimensions for tables and chairs and things like that, but. For me, I, I mean, think about like any kind of a sitting surface, anywhere between 16 and 18 inches is going to be a good yeah. height. Um, so, you know, you base it off of commonly used dimensions that apply across lots of different types of, of furniture, and I just kind of go from there. Yeah, and we have, um, our house is full of antique furniture. Before I kind of building, I started building stuff for a hobby. I restored antiques. I go buy pretty cheap, you know, late 19th century stuff, oak, and restore it. So I've got a number of pieces in the house that I like, and that's what I go to. I like the dimensions, so I, I'm constantly going and measuring those. You know, how how yeah. thick, you know, how big is this leg? Because I know that leg looks nice, you know. So yeah, yeah. how how thick is that, and how thick is this? How wide is this rail? Because I know on this on this uh, on this desk I have over here, I really like the rail. So, you know, things like that. When you when you thought about materials, did you did you only think about wood or did you think about other other materials as well? In this case I just thought about wood and you know the only reason I used oak here is because what I is what I had. Right. Sit, sitting around. Um, I had some quarter-inch cherry too, and I was thinking about that, but then I pulled the board out, and it was kind of 
it's kind of wonky, so that's what happens with these little thin guys. Um, you know, and then of course, I as soon as I built it out of this quarter saw and oak, it's like, oh well, this thing just screams like arts and crafts, you know. Now, <laughs> whether yeah. if it, had I built it out of like cherry, it might not have. But um, yeah, uh, you know, I have a number of those sitting around, and I've a few times I've built them out of even a different wood than I ended up using, you know, to make something just because it's what I had. And I was and yeah. really I'm just going for the visual in terms of the proportions and stuff rather than the, the final materials there. And that's one of the good things, one of the one of the times where I like to use paint because it covers up all the grain and you can just yeah. get a feel of the form without looking at the grain. That's true. I've gone so far as to like finish and kind of dial in some of the details with like a, a black pen just to you know see what um, dowel plugs will look like, for example in the yeah. context of the piece itself, or kind of finish it with like just a spray shellac. I mean, you can spray with shellac in 10 minutes, it's done. Yeah. And it just has a bit more of a, a finished appearance and kind of fills in some of the mistakes as well. Hmm. What'd you use to glue it together, just out of curiosity? So my, I, I've used CA glue before, but I don't, I, you know, now I just use white type on one, mm -hmm. and I hold it, to, I size it with CA, I size the, the biggest problem is the ingrain, because it just, even on a little piece like that, it just soaks up the glue, so I'll size, I'll put a little drop of CA glue on the ingrain, yeah. and that'll, that'll size it, that'll kind of plug up those pores, and then I just use type on one, and I hold it together for about 20, 30 seconds, and that's usually enough. Yeah. I used, um, uh, CA glue as well, like a gel formula, and it's it's great. Right. It, I mean, it, it holds. It doesn't drip as as easily as regular CA glue, and and it's got you know, like you said, 15 seconds, you're done. I'd yeah, probably, I'd probably use hot glue. <laughs> yeah, that would work. That would. One one thing I want to get, I know Lee Valley sells them. It's those little Japanese clamps. They're little miniature bar clamps. I think they're made out of brass. Mm -hmm. They work great for uh, for little models. Yeah, that they was work. that was a bit of a challenge trying to clamp up. I yeah. was using like a big K body clamp to clamp <laughs> up a, a, a foot long yeah. bench. So I'm like yeah. delicately dialing it in, <laughs> and just kind of crunch it. Rubber, rubber yeah. bands, man. Rubber bands. <laughs> double stick yeah, tape. I, I ended, rubber bands yeah, and glue tape. tape. Yep. Forget the glue, just use double stick tape. <laughs> what we need is a little tiny domino, Chris. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna say that. You could drill little holes, too. drill little holes, and cut toothpicks, and do it. Yeah. Do it. So, you could, yeah, so you Eric, could are you going to build that. this table full size, Eric? Do what? Are you going to build this table full size? Well, a coffee table is on my list. We've got kind of a junky one right now, and I have a big slab of oak that's in the basement. It needs a little bit more drying. drying. I'm not sure if it'll be exactly this design, but that oak is destined for, uh, for, for a table, for sure. Yeah. I like. I really love the top. Um, the base uh, I could do with or without. I'm not a big arts and crafts fan, as you know. Yeah. Um, I really like the stretchers and how you position them far enough back that you can't see them from the front view. Or right. you'd have to be really low. Um, I don't know how low you'd have to be, um, but at an 18 inch or 17 inch top, you'd have to be pretty low to see that. Yeah. It's almost like you'd miss the asymmetric <coughs> positioning of those once the top is on. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting. It's an interesting detail. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You were talking earlier about um, the decision between one or two stretchers, and yeah. uh, the other feature that, or the other purpose of the stretcher is to keep the legs from racking. So if you kick the right. leg, doesn't it collapse. Um, I yeah. Noticed that the, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and even just for ease of construction, I mean, 
to to be able to connect the two so they can stand upright while you yeah. while you figure out how the top's going to go on, <laughs> um, even if it's not necessary for the whole racking. Because I think if you had a I don't know if you had a pretty a coffee table. I, I don't know if I'd worry as much about racking as like a desk because it's pretty low. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But um, and if you had a nice thick top, even with no stretcher, I think you might be okay. But I think even with that, I'd build at least one just yeah. just, just to hold everything up. You know. I guess I guess it depends how you attach. If you attach the yeah. legs to the top directly, which I hadn't thought of. So I may have missed something. Is, is Eric? Is your design a a uh, coffee table then? Yes, it's a low okay. table. So it's about it's about. I just cut the legs off off of it, you know. Right. So it's about 16, 17 inches tall, somewhere some around there. Yeah, I, I yeah. thought it looked shorter. Yeah. yeah, I just I had missed that aspect of it. So cool. I, is, I love that you uh, that you took it in a in a different direction entirely in yeah. a lot of ways, and you just did a lot different. And I, I'm, I'm excited about that. So changing what the table was and then changing changing how it's presented and doing the model is just fantastic. So Yeah. Yeah. Cool. cool. Like I um, said, is, I, I was sorry, go ahead. Is sixteen or seventeen inches to the top of the the main surface or the upper surface? It's the main. Okay. So, so you could, the top is a little bit higher. Yeah, so that shelf would be a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And you could play with, you know, that this I just, they're about the same thickness on my model, but you could play with that, I think, if you built it. You know, you might, I might even, like, do, if I was going to build this, I might even kind of do a few other mock-ups with a thinner shelf and maybe a thicker shelf and just to kind of see what I, what I liked. But, um, but yeah. Um, I was going to ask you as well, is the uh, sculpted edge something you would carry on to the full scale, or is that just um, an efficiency thing? No, that's what I was, I would definitely want it to have kind of a carved look, you know, kind of a sculpted, that that, sh that shelf, kind of a flowing and kind of a hand um, sculpted look to it, especially on that edge there, rather than have some kind of abrupt edge or a simple, you know, symmetrical um, cove to it or something like that. Um, and again, that's, that's, it's, it's kind of the dichotomy with the base and the top, the top being more modern and the base being more traditional, to kind of have some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of hand look there. So it'll almost be like an OG profile in, from the one top to the other. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. It just kind of slips down and then... Yeah, maybe. I mean, you could you could kind of play with that. I if, if, again, if I was going to build it, I'd probably do a few different little iterations of that, just real quick to see what I liked. But, um, but yeah, the the point there is it kind of flows down into that main table. I like that layered look. That looks really cool. It does. The light and the dark. Would you just yeah. laminate the two of those together? Yeah, probably. Okay. I mean, like I said, you could really. You could carve it out of one piece, but that'd be a, it'd be a lot of work, and you'd waste a lot of wood by doing that. I, mean, I think I think it would be a neat look, but as long as, long as you had Bill Gregg's uh, CNC set up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lord. Yeah. I don't yeah. don't have one of those. Um, but you know, as, as I look at it, though, I kind of like the if you did use two different woods or stained it or something like that. I think the the yeah. you know the um, I think it's a it's a neat look. I, I, I would definitely say with the contrast in colors. I think that's I think that's awesome. I think yep. yeah. not having the grain contrast too much um, would yeah. make it awesome. Without making like if the grain contrast that I think would be yeah like a visually visually disrupting. I think it could be cool if the um, the darker top was kind of inset into the lower top a little bit. Ah uh, okay. I think yeah. that, I think that might look, and so instead of it just looking like oh, okay. instead of it looking like it's just sitting there, it looks like the two pieces. Because um, when I look at it in this view, the two pieces are flowing together. So when I look at it from the ends or the edges, I also want it to look like the two pieces have flowed together. Oh yeah. So like mm -hmm. when, you, when you go to that end view, Chris, um, uh, this one. I wouldn't have, yeah, that one you have right now. I wouldn't have the chamfer. Um, 
between, between the them. between the two tops. Yeah. I yeah. Would almost want it to look like a piece of chocolate melted into that top. <laughs> and and I would do that. <laughs> the s'mores table. And I would do that as well. Yeah. And that was actually my original intent, but that was that's kind of a. I'm glad you caught that. Thanks for that. That was a mess well, on my I'll, part. I'll, um, what I did was, <laughs> what I did was, I beveled, I beveled the entire yeah. top. I beveled the entire top, and then I was like, you know, I need a shell, but I had already yeah. beveled the top. Uh, so if I was doing it, that bevel would go away where they were sandwiched yeah. together. Yeah, I like, I like it. I mean, so here's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Thank, thanks for giving me an awesome design that I can steal for a future idea. <laughs> but I do like the. I, I think we all want to steal parts of it. Yeah, there's parts. Of it, yeah, there's parts of it I definitely want to steal. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, you can do oak. Couldn't you? Couldn't you just fume? Couldn't you fume the oak on the, the oak. top and get that dark look? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that way you cool. have, yeah. have the same grain. So That's, the cool, the cool yeah. thing is that if you had it where uh, the grain really matched well, like maybe the piece that you cut from the front. Yes, that's what I'm right? thinking. Yeah. yeah, it comes from right and here. Some kind of match. The mate. Or, yeah, the mate. Yeah. So that because it's it's great that the the grain isn't disruptive, it's it's cool that the color is different. But I think if you use something that was wildly different in grain, it would just look yeah, like yeah. Um, yeah, like it just look weird to me. Like a flat sawn walnut on a quarter sawn oak. Yeah. Yeah. With with just yeah. With big cathedral flame pattern. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's awesome. I think, yeah, straight grain is definitely the way to go for this. I think. Yeah, oh yeah. And I like your idea of taking that cut off from the front and flipping it over to the back yeah. or an adjacent piece anyhow and then uh, yeah. staining it and then setting it in to the bottom. Yeah, yeah I got to imagine, I mean, you could probably make an adjustment in kind of the angle itself and kind of the curves so that you would be able to get exactly the, the mate of it on that yeah. side and just yeah. flip it over. Mm -hmm. I also like the... Um, the curve in the underneath the top there, and I think it's I think it's almost a shame that they're a little bit hidden. You're talking to the stretchers. Yeah, yeah, stretchers. And so I wonder if there's a way to make I don't I don't know which piece, but I wonder if there's a way to take one of the structural elements um, in the legs or in the vertical pieces or the stretchers in the in the ends and do and do echo those curves somehow or I don't know I just think that curve is pretty cool and 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 it's almost a shame that it's under the top and people won't really see it I think I think at the same time yeah. though it's kind of fun that that there's things to discover yeah oh yeah definitely yes it, it's it's yeah. kind of cool that when you look on it you're like oh that curves too so yeah I kind of like the discovery of yeah things you could put a, put a mirror put a mirror on the floor <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> that could be multi-purpose. There's the bad idea. <laughs> for uh, it's for it's, it's for kids. Uh, it's for your kids to discover. Then they're crawling under your furniture and looking yeah. up. Yeah, um, the kids and the and the yeah. furniture makers. And that yeah, that reminds me from kind of a functional aspect of this. The the um, those ends, you know, that bottom rail is pretty close to the floor, which means it's just going to get banged by a vacuum cleaner about a thousand times <laughs> yeah. in its life, you know? But, you know. It's character. It's furniture. Yeah. <laughs> right? And how many people are looking for that antique piece of furniture that shows all those marks on it already? So. Yeah, true. Yeah. As, as uh, you know, craftsmen who are making custom pieces or, you know, whatever, then we're we're making future antiques, so yeah, kind of you kind of want that. You want it to be used and lived with, but not abused too much. No, not abused. I want I want people who buy my stuff to go out there every week with Renaissance wax and because <laughs> people do that, right? They don't just oh use wet wax. Oh, for about three weeks, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they're. I don't they're do that to my own stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah, I don't personally. I don't like that. There's a that whole distress thing where people take keys and chains and beat their furniture to try to make it look old. I don't. I don't get that at all. Yeah. It's his, history market. Work. <laughs> yeah. 
We want everything now without waiting for it. So. Yeah, right. Damn MTV. <laughs> <laughs> it's a microwave's fault. It's conditioned yeah. us. <laughs> it is. Well, do we want to talk about the bench now? I think so. Uh, if anybody has any more questions for Eric, you can drop them into uh, Twitter using hashtag woodchat, and we'll ask Eric. Um, for now, I think we'll move on to Andy's bench. And Andy, I don't have any pictures of your bench. Um, okay. Um, I post it here. I can uh, let me pull up here. Can you screen share them? Um, screen share. You can screen share or I can screen share, whichever works. I got it. You got it. All right. Wow. That is pretty cool. All right. So um, this is this is the second prototyping project that I've done in miniature. Um, I, I kind of shot a uh, an Instagram of it now that Instagram has video, to just kind of look at it from different angles. Um, so this is a, it's a 1-6 scale. Uh, it's going to be about 68 inches wide and uh, about, or 68 inches long, about 20 inches wide, and the back, the, the crests on each of the sides there uh, will be about 32. So the idea here is that I didn't want to build something that looked like a park bench. Um, I wanted to create something that was maybe a little bit more unique, a little bit more comfortable, something that you could actually sit in sideways and kind of put your feet up on the bench itself, and it would kind of cradle you a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then those the backs, um, will they'll be sculpted a little bit more. They'll be kind of carved in on the, on the okay. corners. Uh, or on the on the on the the top crest rail piece there, um, and again that's just a detail that I didn't want to dial in until I get to the real full size piece. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just uh, you know it, it's going to be it's going to be made out of teak. Um, I got some killer teak uh, last couple of weeks at a big wood sale that I coordinated, and I got a commission. I was fortunate enough to get a commission project to build something like this. So. Um, it's going to be outside. Midwest? Yeah, that was the that was the big sale. I was really, because I was in Cincinnati um, the day before it, and I was trying to figure out how I could stay for an extra day just to check the sale out. I yeah. couldn't afford to buy anything. <laughs> I to come by, so I didn't, I didn't I, get a chance to. So I I came back with uh, with pretty much a ton, literally a ton of lumber. Um, so it was uh, it was it was pretty sweet. Lots of teak, lots of sapele. Um, uh, I I came anything? back with about 150, 160 board feet of babinga. Wow. Um, eight quarter babinga. The stuff is like granite. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How do I turn off screen share here? Uh, click click screen share again. Yeah, there you go. Looks like you're good. So the first thing, it's interesting, the first thing I thought about when, when you showed that bench was that's a bench that encourages people to sit face-to-face. -face. Yep, that's the whole idea. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I really like it. So they can... Here's the, here's the bench. And then I kind of... You, know, you can't really see it here. You can, I think you can see it in the, in the... It's on my website. It's the most recent post. Um, but... The 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 joinery is going to be um, uh, draw bore pegs, so it's just super tight, super strong. Um, since it's teak, I'll use polyurethane glue. Um, looking for an excuse to use that on a project. It's perfect for outdoor use. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you know the the slats, the seat slats. Those will just be screwed in with uh, stainless steel screws, and then I'll put um, plugs in and cover those up. Yeah. Yeah. I missed everything you just so said. So it's you know it was the. Well, you don't that? have to repeat. 
you don't have to repeat yourself. I just I missed all of that because my internet is uh, messing up. So. Bugger. The executive no, summary. The executive summary is draw bore peg joinery and polyurethane glue, since it's teak. Nice. So the uh, the first one that I did was was this other bench. It's kind of this was a slightly larger scale okay. version you of should, it. Um, you showed that one to us a while ago, didn't you? What's that? You showed that to us on WoodChat a while ago, didn't you? Yeah, it's finished yeah. now. Yep, yeah. so that one's done. That was um, that was one that I finished fairly recently. Um, I can screen share again. That so that out. model you're working on, on now, what I saw was a bench where you sit uh, facing, I don't know, forward or backwards, not facing each other, but um, either facing one of the long, I don't know, sitting across it. Does that make sense? Yeah, you'd be, you could you could have two people that would yeah be facing each other with Sit your side, feet up. Right. Yep. Or side or side by side. Right. Wow. Um, are those are backrests or armrests on the ends? Um, are you talking about the one that I'm screen sharing right now? Uh, the, the one before the the one you're working on currently. Uh, okay, hold on here. So they're they're backrests. They're not armrests. Okay. They're going to be okay. too high for an armrest, which is usually around like 25 or 26. These are going to be somewhere at the uh, 30 to 32 range. Okay. So yeah, they, 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 they did look high. Yeah, yeah. They're intentionally high. I mean, I I like the uh, I like kind of playing with the the Asian style of of design here. I mean, it's Definitely got influences there. Um, the the top backrests I'll probably pull from some stuff that I've done that I've ripped off from Thomas Mosier Designs as well. The Edo bench that he's got, I kind of I'll probably use the the backrest as kind of a starting point for um, for kind of how I'll, I'll I'll tackle that particular part. So. And I think then I'd the, like to see a bit of curve in, in the top of the backrest myself. Yeah, so the, they're straight right now, but what I'll do is I'll probably use another piece of 10 quarter um, at the top of the crest rail because the, the sides are all 10 quarter stock. Mm -hmm. So the top I'll use 10 quarter and then basically carve it back with like the bandsaw and then put some some details and edging on it so it's it's a much more curved more comfortable thing for someone to kind of sit back on um, up along the the, the backrests there I mean you can sit on it without using the backrest just facing on it like a normal bench but it's just the intent was to just do something a little bit unique you know oh, the, other, yeah. the other thing about that bench is that if people don't sit face to face leaning against the backrest that's a bench that doesn't have a back or a front. So right. You have one person facing one way and one person facing another way. Yeah, so you can it either encourages lots of social interaction face to face or you can completely ignore the other person. <laughs> <laughs> Just pretty so, much how society works anyway right now. Yeah. The only yeah. other thing I was the only other thing I was thinking about and I don't know if you can see where my cursor is right now on the screen but Yep. The between the two um, vertical pieces here uh, on the sides, I was thinking of putting some sort of natural stone in it. We've got some really cool um, fossils that are uh, that you can find in the rivers here in Cincinnati or the riverbeds that are about 450 million years old. They're ocean fossils, and they're they're kind of neat looking and a little unique. So I could kind of cut one of those on my tile saw and kind of get it to fit in between on each side. I thought that could be kind of an interesting element and just add a new, you know, add a new material to the mix. Yeah. Am I seeing, am I seeing correctly on the, uh, the actual bench top um, that's kind of scooped out a little bit? Yeah. It's got a yeah. saddle. Yep. Yeah. The, right there you go. So, the between the 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 full size of these rails will be about three inches, 
They'll be beefy, though. They're going to be uh, about an inch and three-quarter thick because they're going into ten-quarter leg stock. So it's just everything's going to be just really massive and strong and beefy about it. But the, the dip probably goes down about a half an inch or so. I haven't really kind of worked that out yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of cut some pieces out of plywood, lay the slats down on it, and kind of see what the different angles feel like. Yeah. It, needs, it needs to feel good both when you're sitting on it as a normal bench and you also need to kind of get your butt in between the, you know, the, the curve of it because the, la the, the slats on the outside on either edge sit perpendicular or sit parallel to the ground while, every, while all the others kind of curve in. So you want you want to oh, okay. back. <clears throat> you want it to snuggle the bum, right? Exactly. Yeah. Andy, that that bottom stretcher that yep. runs in between the two bottom rails, how is that connected? Um, I was thinking of doing um, probably two. Two tenons. I don't know if I want to do like a through tenon or a wedge tenon all the way through. Um, I think you want to tend to avoid end grain joinery like that if it's going to be outside. Right. So I, I figured, you know, just a couple of uh, a couple of tenons that'll be kind of parallel to the ground and and kind of maximize the flat, um, uh, Maximize the the surface area that that'll that'll kind of glue it up. I don't know if I'm going to do a lamination or just cut it from a a, a big piece of teak. It kind of kills me because it's going to have to be about four and a half inches wide to kind of get that curve. Yeah, yeah. And teak isn't cheap. <laughs> First time I've like ever it. used teak too. It's fun. It's nice. I got some beautiful pieces, but it's uh, a little it smells little good, doesn't it? What's that? It smells good when you cut it. Yeah, like Great. horse uh, horse poo. <laughs> Isn't it kind of really? sweet? It really stinks like horse poo. I, I, it, it smells like manure. Huh. Yeah. The, the teak that I have smells very cinnamony. Cinnamony? Yep. Got Maybe it. Andy's came out, of, came out of a horse barn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I know. Maybe different. Stuff out of Maybe different species have, you know, have different uh, properties. Hmm. Or maybe, maybe Scott doesn't know what cinnamon really, really is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, I made you some yeah. cookies. I made you some cinnamon, <laughs> cinnamon uh, cookies. <laughs> the sapele, the stuff that I used for the other bench, that smelled like cinnamon and nutmeg, but not the teak. Huh. So, yeah, the... the the small, the small miniature prototyping has just been a great exercise for me. It's just it makes it makes it a heck of a lot easier to to kind of play with and and just kind of mess with different designs and I get a, a much better sense for proportions and size and and shape and scale um, than than drawing alone. Plus, again, it, you you get a, a fun little piece that you can kind of have sitting around the house when you're done. Mm -hmm. Do you, you said, think, do the, go ahead, Eric. You, you said this was a commission piece built for somebody else. Yeah, I'm building it for someone else. So did the I'm um, assuming you showed them this model. Like this was probably helpful for them. Yeah, yeah. I I did a couple of initial sketches and shared um, shared just some general ideas. Uh, with them that that gave a sense for kind of what was inspiring me. I told them I'm thinking of a a bench that doesn't have a traditional back on it, um, and you know the material uh, was somewhat driven by what the client was looking for. Um, so I'll probably my goal is to have some of this either in the final stages of assembly or being being able to assemble this at at the Woodworking in America conference. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Um, on, on the, the uh, on the um, marketplace floor, or in, in a, are you teaching a session or something? Um, it'll be on the marketplace floor. I'm, cool. I work at the Gorilla Glue booth, so. Oh, that's right. And hence the connection between teak and polyurethane glue. I mean, that's that's why they invented that polyurethane glue to begin with to 
glue up oily woods like teak and have the have the bonds last outside in the elements. So yeah. it seems like a good match. Cool. That that stretch along the front looks a little bit uh, heavy to me. Have you thought about um, curving the bottom edge? Um, are you talking about the upper stretcher? Yes, that one there. Yeah, you know, my, my brother said exactly the same thing. It's like, you know, you think about adding that curve to it, and I, that could be, a, you know, an easy detail that I could, I could dial in, you know, right up to the last point of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, assembly. Even a half inch of curve, I think, would be a significant change. Yeah. Yeah, I think, the, I think it would make it feel a lot less boxy and mimic a little bit more of the, the stretcher below it. Mm -hmm. And then the stretchers on the sides, and it would it would have a little bit more continuity. Um, I'm trying to do I'm trying to bring some of those elements, the curved elements as well, kind of towards the the, the bottom here. Um, and then I'll flare out the sides as well. It didn't come out on this on this particular design, but if you look at it this way, it's still kind of boxy on the sides. So wow. I'll end up flaring it out a bit on the ends there as well. Um, it's just a matter of how much I can get out of my 10 quarter stock. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't um, consider that a horrible loss if I couldn't get it to flare on the sides that way, but front view I think it's it's more critical to have that. Yeah. Um, that lower stretcher, if you had it straight as well, any curve you put in the upper stretcher would be accentuated a bit more I think. So even you're saying if I had a, a light curve here, mm -hmm. but a more dramatic curve here, it would it would make uh, the I'm other saying, one I'm saying, more. I'm saying no curve at all at the bottom. So keep this straight and curve the upper one. That's right. Hmm. Then I'd be saving some teak too. <laughs> 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 I think I think I would try that. So curve the upper and keep the lower straight. Mm -hmm. Because then I'd be remaining consistent with kind of what's what's going on here. Although it's, it's not curved on this edge, it's curved under here. So then the front would be kind of the inverse of it. Right. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I like the design a lot. Looks like a very practical and marketable design. Cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Thanks. The uh, the um, the scooped out seat there reminded me of a uh, vaguely reminded me of a picture that, that um, I don't know if you guys follow a company named Blank. They're I think they're Japanese on Facebook. Let me screen share here a second. They shared a a bench the other day. That I thought was just gorgeous, and it's got this. Oh yeah. The the top is two pieces, and they they've each got a, a slight bevel on it in, towards the center. Yeah. But I, I thought that I, was just really really sharp. I've done that with um, a, a replica of the Thomas Mosier Edo bench. It's the same thing. You you basically yeah. just shove a little kind of eighth inch strip underneath. The board and just run it through the planer, and you get that bevel like that. It's a yeah. fun technique. Yeah, it it really creates a unique look that I think is is very very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing I'm thinking about is that with with the with the curve here on the rail, I'm wondering if I'm going to have to do something on the lower. Um, the lower surfaces of of each of the slats for them to sit a little bit more flush hmm. because you know there's yeah how wide are they um, they'll probably be about two and a half inches wide and they're both hardwood right they're all teak everything's yeah. teak. Okay. So there's no no give there. You can't just yeah. suck it down a little bit tighter. Yeah, much <laughs> no, they're gonna be they'll they'll either be three quarters of an inch or almost seven eighths of an inch thick. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I, I mean, what I could do is I could basically run them 
run them on the table saw and and cut a very very gentle taper so it would be like three facets essentially that I mean it would be like a big chamfer on each of the edges yeah. and that would maybe reduce or it would give me more surface area to contact with on the curved piece. Mm -hmm. You could also get a template set up with your router and then shape uh, like a, a lap joint in the end of each of those slats in a slight radius to match. I'm not sure I'm following you there. Um, what do you mean? You stand, you'd stand up each of your slats in, in a vise or something and then put a template on top uh -huh. with, with a curve that matches the, uh, the, the stretcher and use a straight bit in the router to route in the ends of the slats uh, the, the, the reverse profile, the mating profile of the stretcher. That curve. Oh, just on the edges. Just on the edges. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was like, God, why yeah. would you do that on the whole rail? No. On the whole. No, no. <laughs> yeah. You just do the lap joint, basically. That's cool. And I that may would, have to. Uh, I may have to have a follow-up conversation with you on that in terms of how to execute it. But I think that would be, that would be a perfect solution. And with teak on teak, it would give you a nice tight fit, which you you can't, you can't fudge. Have you worked with teak before? Yes, I have. No. Any uh, any words of advice? I had a pretty good time with it actually. I I actually learned to cut hand cut dovetails in teak. Um, and I cut. It was actually for. Um, I cut a triple mortise and tenon, which I'd never done before, and a. Uh, a set of dovetails in teak, and that was the first time working with teak, and the first time cutting that joinery too. Um, it's oily, so you've got your gluing figured out. Um, it's open poured, so don't get any white stuff in there. I think I got some white wax or something in mine, but um, no, it, it didn't do too bad. Did you, um, before you glued everything up, did you use uh, any kind of mineral spirits? I think that I did. Okay. Um, now I just used uh, my PVA glue with it, whatever I was using at the time. Um, polyurethane would be a bit different. Okay. Cool. I, if I if I did that lap that 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 mating curve on the underside, I don't know if I'd take it all the way out to the edge. I'd, prob I'd try and figure out a way to do it where it didn't go all the way out to the edge. Does, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's there's a there's an overlap. Uh, you can't really see it here. I almost do like a curved a curved uh, dado. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking to begin with. Um, In the cool. bottom there. Yeah, because it 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 over it goes over the edge. It it basically comes out so it's. It's tangential with the edge of the the legs, the outer edge of the leg. Yeah. So it, it goes over it probably by about three quarters of an inch to an inch. Yeah. Okay. Only thing is, is that when you have a piece like that where it's end grain and it's a smaller component, it seems like it's going to be more prone to like cracking and checking and splitting with yeah. the elements. Yeah. I think the the goal is you want to keep the pieces thick, consistent, and and somewhat whole. Yeah. So, but that's why know. I might just do the. That's why I might just do a um a a dado where those made up with the curved piece that they that they're joined to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you could do it with a straight bit and a sled again, but instead of holding the piece up vertically, you'd lay it flat. And you, your router would travel across a hump, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would take as little out as possible. Yeah, I mean, and it doesn't have to have the entire thing coming in contact with it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You want to get some some good connection with it, because then again, you're talking about water that could potentially sit in there. Yeah, definitely. Do and yeah, outdoor building for outdoor. There's just a whole slew of things that you have to consider. You know, I mean, I read I read a lot of, like, what Hank Gilpin talks about in terms of uh, 
his perspective, and it's like, don't even finish it. Just let it go gray. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, Epiphanes, you know, six coats of Epiphanes marine varnish will go for a long time before you have to worry about anything going gray. Is that what you put on the Sapelli bench? Yeah, six coats. That, that, spray that, it or hand, or hand brush it? What's that? Did you spray it or hand brush it? Hand. You have more patience than me, sir. Yeah, I haven't gone <laughs> down the spray route yet. I just I haven't had the the gumption to kind of get the whole setup working and you know get a, a, a spray area. Yeah. So that's all right. You know, I have I have limited amounts of time, so that if if I've got to spread out the the finishing process over a week or two, it's not a big deal for me. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I like I like both the miniatures you guys made. I think both of the designs are pretty darn awesome. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I agree. So what's next, Chris? What's next? It's eight o'clock. Gonna... We can keep going, or we can. Scott's got a plane to show. <laughs> Scott, this, a... this is uh, this is my teak experience. Ah. Okay. I I just finished. Uh, Twelve of these, and I've got uh, oh, twenty-three boy. more to do. So, how many more to do? Uh, twenty-three. Holy, Holy crap! Smokes. I don't so know if that's showing up real nicely on the. Oh, it is. It's there. showing up nice. So, so, what kind of glue are you using, Scott? Uh, I used uh, West Systems epoxy. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty safe bet. Yep. This box is um, one that I used <laughs> Tcon. It's the only project that I've used Tcon and. Um, not that I wouldn't go back to it, but I just haven't had a, a need for it. What is that? You have a little gauge there? Yeah, it, it's called a box. A box called Necessity. And um, I dropped a link into Twitter. Um, it's, there's a whole story behind it. Um, um, it's basically my way of poking fun at woodworkers for being crazy about measuring everything the, the to crazy degrees, I'm saying it just it doesn't matter. So that that's uh, a dial indicator. It measures the slop in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what it does is it pushes the drawer over to the other side of the drawer box. Yeah, it does that too. <laughs> so that the slop stays pretty consistent. <laughs> what do you oh, put in the drawer? Control mechanism. Uh, you Rulers. Put money in there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the fun part, part um, I got I got all these comments and too many to read here. It starts here and it goes down like this here. And uh, here's one. There's one about um, I got a lot of comments here. Um, I bet it will go to Mississippi University. Playing off the title there, and someone says the Department of Necessity. Department. Mm -hmm. It was a fun project and fun to go to the feedback. You can read that I, a little bit later if you want. I it's, never, I never no, caught. It's called, called a box I, called necessity. I never caught the name, uh, and you purposely misspelling necessity. Yeah, I, I hadn't caught that before. Yeah, nice. uh, I got a, I got a few reactions. Uh, one of them here. Oh no, you you misspelled yeah, necessity. <laughs> I can't even say it anymore. <laughs> oh no! You, spelled ne you misspelled necessity. Cool box, though. <laughs> right over their head. That's um, great. Scott, remember that piece of wood that I had the other day? I was showing you that piece of birch. I said, "Oh yeah." Saving it to make a plane. He said, "Hey, make a plane." So I made a plane. Sweet. So it's got a lignum sole, and cool. lig lignum, of course, like. Like teak is one of those hard to glue wood, so yeah. I thought it's a, it's a pretty big surface. I'll try it. I wiped it down with mineral spirits and then glued it with uh, a PVA glue. I can't remember. I think I used the Gorilla PVA and clamped it for 24 hours plus, and uh, it was, didn't didn't really hold too well. It was peeling off, so I pulled it off, scraped it down, and I put West Systems on it. So that's my go-to glue for the oily stuff. I haven't used the polyurethanes before. Yeah. So I maintained the wany edge there. And it looks like a uh, a Dutch um, 
shoe. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very cool. I love the, the live edge. I gotta find a piece like that. Now. Yeah, oh, I've got lots of it. Uh, no, I don't really. Feel free to no. send me a couple pieces. Yeah. <laughs> I was showing the guys earlier before the show that there was some checking at the end here, and I decided to leave it open. I didn't cut it off, and I didn't didn't want to fill it. I'm just gonna yeah. leave it that way. I don't think it's gonna move or anything. And if it does, I can fix it. I don't know if you remember on on our uh, um, scrub plane build off the piece yeah, so of I was white oak that, that I used. Yeah. Yep. The piece of white oak that I used is all checked on the end, and I love it. You know, oh, it's, really? It's a rough okay. plane, and it looks rough. So. Yep. Kind of cool. Um, I forgot I had pictures taken of, of the the prototype of the the flame birch and teak plane. Oh, uh, okay. Uh -huh. So that's what I got up here. Nice. Nice. It was much darker teak. It was much yeah. darker piece of teak that I used for that than what I had for the rest of it. So. Yeah, that is dark. Hey, I one thing I noticed just as I was milling up a bunch of stuff tonight, there's just there's a, an amazing difference in terms of the colors, even within the same board. It goes from yellows oh, yeah. to greens to browns to you know dark dark chocolate. Yeah. I was not I was not expecting that even <laughs> within the same board. I, I got my teak from uh, Shannon through uh, um, the Hardwood to Go site. He had a, a bunch of cutoffs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I went, I, I cleaned it all up and planed it all down. And I did not know that um, teak, when you plant it, it, you know, it it's, a, it's a wood that reacts to UV light quite mm -hmm. strongly. And so when you plane off the stuff that's already aged, you get all those colors that, like you're talking about. Right. Yeah. And there was pinks and, and greens, like you said, and I'm like, well, wait. Because you saw the picture of, of that I showed of the prototype. I was like, this isn't anything like the prototype that all the pictures in the in the catalog are going to show. <laughs> so, so, so I left, uh, I called Shannon and left on a message like, dude, I hope something's not screwed up here or what's going on and all that. And so he replied back and let me know, just reassure me. That, yeah, that's that's normal for key. Give it a suntan for about 15 minutes and you'll see a drastic difference. And sure enough, I stuck all the pieces out in the sun and, and 15 minutes, half an hour later, it was all much more even. And, and oh, so you, it, so. it becomes more uniform? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so if, if you... Uh, there's your pro I mean, obviously your bench is going to be outside anyway, so you'll it'll do well. Don't no don't what. put a UV um, filtering it's finish on it when it's raw wood because it won't yeah it won't even out. Yeah, definitely uh, age age it before you finish it a little bit. So okay. So um, we were talking about gluing uh, exotics and uh, whether it was polyurethane or um, epoxy. Um, Adam Maxwell says etch with garlic, then use hot hide glue on oily exotics. Are you sure what? that's not is that not Stephen Shepard saying that? Or? No, but what? <laughs> yes. what the heck does that mean? That's in, uh, if garlic. you look up if you look at Stephen Shepard's book, yeah, um, he mentions that that he he uses garlic to etch etch wood, and it's an old technique to. Uh, for for prepping wood for glowing. So what the, garlic heck, work? what the heck is it? What do you 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 got your like <laughs> you got your garlic neck necklace to keep the vampires away? <laughs> <laughs> Rub it on the wood because garlic itself is oily. Like, what's the technique there? I don't understand the chemistry of it, and I, and I've never tried it. But what's the technique? Do you huh. literally just take garlic and rub it all over the wood? Yeah, I guess so. And and then you, okay, I got to I got to figure out what the heck this is. Email and then uh, you just put it in your spaghetti when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> he and Adam says, "Yeah, this is from Stephen Shepard's book on hide glue." Yeah. Email Stephen and he'll 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 tell you all about it. Interesting. I'm just going to stick with the polyurethane glue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No etching required. <laughs> hmm. So I'm just thinking you, you get garlic one of the nicest smelling things like um and then you have high glue, probably one of the most foul smelling things in the shop. <laughs> I don't know. Just thought I'd mention that. 
Yeah. Every time I have... You won't want to have any visitors that day. Except the dogs, man. My dog... Every time I have high glue, the dogs start smelling. They come into the shop, and they they love it. As long as they don't start marking the shop. Yeah. <laughs> what the heck? Etching with garlic? It's, now, now I've never heard of anything. <laughs> Now I'm a, I'm gonna be on a I'm gonna be on a like it's like I'm in a song stuck in your head. Uh-huh. You're you're going down the uh, internet rabbit hole of research now, aren't you? Yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> what uh, the heck? So before we totally lose Matt, do you guys want to wrap it up? <laughs> <laughs> we should probably do that. Yes, we should probably do that. Um. Well, Andy and Eric, thanks for showing off your designs. I thought they were awesome. I think the technique of using miniatures uh, is pretty cool, especially um, when you get to see the final product. I remember, Andy, you showed us your your bench, your Sapelli bench, and now you've got the thing really built, so that's pretty cool. Um, who is next, Chris? Is it Bill? Bill. Bill Griggs, yes. Okay, so... Uh, Bill Griggs, he's a CNC enthusiast, so I look forward <laughs> to seeing something that um, might be very hard to replicate with hand tools or power tools next or week. Or might not be. Or might not be, but it might be. Um, but that, that'll, that'll be pretty cool. Um, okay. Any closing thoughts from you guys? Uh, awesome I just wanted job, to mention... Oh, yeah, very good job, guys. Very, very, very good job. Thank you. I don't know where this stuff's going. Um, I just want to mention real quick, I'm going to be in Atlanta at uh, Highland Woodworking this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Uh, Friday afternoon and, and most of Saturday. So um, you can be there and, and check out the new plane there. Um, I don't know if they'll have them for sale yet or not, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of, it's not really official yet, but I'm making it official, so. Uh, they'll be available in the, in, from Highland, so. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah, so buy them from Highland so that they buy some more. That is, um, Scott, congratulations. But, yeah, so that's kind of cool. It's a special edition plane birch and teak plane. But, yeah, I'll be there with, with my planes and just hanging out, so. So how would one buy a plane from Highland if they're not on the site, can we, can we write them and say, hey, I heard that Scott is making some planes and I want one? Um, I believe it will be coming out in the fall uh, catalog. Okay. A so, little, little ways away? I think it's coming out soon. Okay. I know they, they needed the picture back in July, so, um, of, the, of the prototype and all that, so. I don't know. I'll find out more details on that later. So I'm, I'm sure it's All coming right. soon on the website and on the catalog. Yep. Okay. Anything from you, Chris? Um, just some uh, um, maintenance stuff. Um, Andy, we had you down for wood chat starting this week for the design, and I think you said that you're you've got your bench to build. So maybe we can reschedule it, you in for another date. Yeah, that that'll probably be. Be better. I've got a couple of things I gotta wrap up for some clients. Okay. Um, it Keep looks like those the next clients happy. Be, yes. <laughs> the, the next window we have is a start date of October 16th, which I think is right after, or maybe even during Woodworking America. So. 16th is the day before the setup. Yeah. Okay. So that should be fine for you, right? <laughs> Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I won't be there. I'll I will be asleep early so I can leave the house at four or five in the morning. Oh, so, so you'll be there? Uh, WA? Yeah. No, I will be. Uh, I'll be leaving Thursday morning on okay. the setup day and try and get there by. I'll try and get there by noon. Everyone, come to the Gorilla Glue booth. I'll be there. Yep. With the bench. With uh, a partial bench, yes. On a bench. Yes. And free bagels and coffee at the Gorilla Glue booth, right? Did you mention, did you mention wood chat? <laughs> yeah. yeah, free bagels and coffee. And teak. <laughs> and, yeah, free teak. 
<laughs> Free tea. Yeah. Teak stirring sticks for your coffee to give it that tea, yeah, tea, tea give it that cinnamon, it that cinnamon. Stung flavor. Yeah. Stirring garlic. sticks of kings. That's funny. No garlic, one garlic wants and to come juice. back and get a cup of coffee. Who <laughs> wants seconds on their coffee? <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely uh, check out the Scott Meek Woodworks booth too, and and I'll have a couple of unique finds there too. So. Cool. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for WoodChat for August 28th, 2013. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific and 10 p.m. Eastern over at uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat. Um, all the sessions are recorded by Google and put up on the uh, our YouTube channel, um, so you can catch up anytime you want. Um, if you've got a design that you'd like to share or you want to participate in the telephone design game, uh, get a hold of Chris or I. <laughs> Um, either via Twitter or on the WoodChat Google Plus page, and uh, let us know, and we can help you get signed up. Um, we will see you next week where Bill Grigg shows off his CNC version of the table for the telephone design game, although he did say he wants people to be able to make it with a drill press and a jigsaw, so um, that that's actually a pretty cool that's actually a pretty cool element where some pretty simple tools, um, and you can be able to build this table. So that's it for today, and we will see you next week. See you later, everybody. Hey guys. See ya.